that says choices for your gaming project. These are the six choices that we want to make available to you. The next one is perhaps the most challenging one intellectually. It's about new funding mechanisms for disaster preparedness. I will explain this. We call it forecast-based financing, or FBF. And it's the, the one that has the most potential to transform the humanitarian world. All right, moving to the next one. The next one is the most complex. <laughs> um, do you see the drawing of the time bomb with the fuse? Yes. Okay. So, allow me to give a little bit of context. We did a little bit of this conversation when I showed up a, a few weeks ago, but I imagine you all forgot by now. The humanitarian sector has two main funding mechanisms. Imagine a pot of money. Even if there's almost no money there, if the pot exists, money can go in to then be taken out to spend. One of the pots of money that exists, one of the funding mechanisms that exists, is for disaster response. Meaning, a hurricane, a flood, a volcanic eruption, something has already happened, is happening, and is killing people. People are dying, but if you did something, you could save lives. For example, get on a boat and rescue people who are stranded on a roof. Or people are sick, go give them medicine. This is disaster response. And if you spend money, you can do very good things. And the funding mechanism exists. There is another pot of money, which is for a normal day. The Red Cross has vehicles. The vehicles need maintenance. They need to change tires. You need to uh, buy a new computer. You need to pay rent and uh, electricity bills. You need to train staff. So on a normal day, you have a budget for you know, either maintenance or development of new projects or writing proposals and so on. And that pot of money exists. We call it the annual appeal. Every year we appeal for help. And uh, people or donors or governments give us some money. What does not exist is what the drawing, the cartoon depicts, which is when there is a signal from science that a disaster, that something bad is likely to happen soon. We don't have money to fund action before the disaster, after the forecast. So if you click to see the text, the context is that there's that missing money pot. We have money for after the disaster, we have money for the normal day, but we don't have money for before the disaster, after the forecast. The issue is that if you spend money in that time window, before the disaster, after science says the disaster is likely, you can do very good things for very cheap and, and relatively simply and much more reliably. It's not only more expensive, but more difficult to save a life when the, when the storm waters are flashing through a city and people are about to drown. The boat is unstable. Whereas if you do it the day before, when the water has come down from the sky, but it's still in the river and not in the city, People can take action by just walking away on their own means, with their valuables, and not just depending on someone to show up with the boat. So we came up with a financial mechanism, we call it forecast-based financing for disaster preparedness, which is nuanced in how it's implemented. There's a pot of money, it's like a bank account. You need to have a threshold of disaster risk that needs to be exceeded. So it cannot be two drops of rain, it has to be a lot of rain. It cannot be some breeze, it has to be a hurricane category one or more. But once the threshold is established and reached by the forecast, then there's some standard operating procedures, some actions that people have to take, spending money to save lives. And that is something that if you could come up with a game that captures that, this is the one that if we help communicate forecast-based financing, I said to the public, because it can work for a broad audience digitally, ideally it would reach those who can contribute either money or decisions, muscle power. Uh, the chances of embrace for this one are not as high as all the previous ones, but if it were to happen, it would have the highest impact, because right now there's billions of dollars being spent in the two extremes, 
and if a small fraction were spent invested in that precious window of opportunity when you see the fuse getting close that time of effort can really have a very very high impact there's a link to a journal article that is should be very clear for MIT students uh, we also have some simpler readings and John and I have been engaged with it and are ready to help this is I insist the one that is intellectually most challenging but I think if you nail it it will also be the most rewarding questions So one thing, when we first started um, designing this class, this was actually our, the, the problem that we were most interested in, um, mainly because the other problems we just didn't, hadn't heard about since. Um, the cholera, cholera was a recent um, yes. uh, proposal that was asked for, and Ebola, of course, um, very, very recent as well. Um, so if you really enjoyed some of the challenges from projects two and three, and you really took on the, the planning aspects, the trade-offs as aspects of those two games, um, if you're looking at kind of trying to trying to communicate to another person how these kind of probabilities works, uh, this is probably a really good project you might be interested in. And I should say also that working with a few MIT teams, including the Humanitarian Response Lab, including the Environmental Engineering, uh, we have uh, two generations of three students plus one professor go to Uganda to work on, on making this happen for real. We got German money to do it. Uh, in Togo and in Uganda. So it's beginning to happen, but it's hard to explain because it's dry. It's like explaining insurance. You know, people get bored before they get it. So maybe a game can help uh, motivate. Our team is working on forecast-based financing. So because we're about planning for disasters, our game is pretty heavy on chance. But what we want to teach the players to do is to use planning and forecasting in order to reduce the effects of that chance and sort of gain valuable skills in, in uh, mitigating that. So basically, if you have, there's one, two, three, four, five testers plus, let's say, each team send out two, two people to test other games. Um, Remember to, remember to rotate. We're going to do this for about 20 minutes, as long as it takes, and then see where we are and do it again um, to get some just quick testing and make sure that the five of us get to play um, a good number of your games and give you some, some feedback on that. So remember, if you're using digital, if, you're not, if a computer is not being used for testing, close it or make it look like it's not being used for testing by typing on it. Um, all right, let's get started. Hi, we're forecast-based funding. The general idea behind our concept is that planning ahead for disasters is much better than trying to react to them. So if you can have operating procedures or ways of planning for them and money allocated for that, you can reduce loss of lives in the event of disasters. We are actually between two prototypes right now that we're testing to try and get at the ideas. The first one is a sort of higher level city-based simulation of a cities at risk of disaster, which you then have to fortify by training volunteers or preparing for upcoming disasters uh, in order to prevent too much damage from happening to them. Uh, one of the problems that we're seeing with the game is that it's kind of abstract and not as uh, interactive for players to to connect with, but they are getting a good understanding of the idea of planning ahead. Yeah, and so to try and address those issues, we have a second prototype right now, which is about um, trying to actually like rescue volunteers in a flooding, uh, uh, rescue people in a flooding city. And so that hits the other end of the scale where the player is told ahead of time, this, um, this disaster was planned for versus this disaster was not planned for and the, like, the uh, appropriate effects for each and then they have to rescue people under those two different conditions and then they get to directly compare like, what the experience of is for like um, acting in one circumstance versus the other. Over the next couple of days we'll be looking at what we learned from both of them and trying to either combine them or pull out the parts that we thought were really useful to make a compelling game. Uh, Tim, do you have your target on this? This is a, this was a hard one. Yeah. yeah. I think we, uh, it was 
I think it was stated a couple of times that we should be looking at people like policymakers or donors in the sense of sort of people who would be allocating funds from governments or nonprofits, things like that, uh, basically to make it clear that this type of planning ahead is a good idea. Um, oh, and what have you decided on technology yet? Are you still not there yet? Uh, we're probably we're using Phaser. Our game uh, is called Hello Waves. We don't have a title screen in yet, but the idea is still forecast-based financing. Uh, so it's a little washed out on there, but if you can see there are these, different, these five different sandcastles with workers associated with each. And up here in the corner, we have a forecast of what the water level will be like in a couple days. This is the water level right here, and throughout the game, it'll rise and fall. And the idea is not to let your workers uh, get drowned by the rising water. And the other aspect of the game, though, is that you have a certain amount of supplies. And whenever you move someone from their castle in order to prevent them from getting drowned, they will consume supplies from that stock. And if you don't have enough supplies, then they'll take damage. So as you can see right now, everybody's in their own castle. If we click next turn, the water level will change and we'll see that the forecast will update. We have a range of values on this forecast, uh, a high prediction and a low prediction. And if you mouse over any of the castles, you'll see a red line appear on the forecast just to help you orient what heights uh, are on the forecast, or if you're looking at the forecast, what it is in the real world. So you can see the water move over these couple days. Right now, the forecast is pretty low. If we see that it's kind of getting close and we're worried about someone, we can click and drag them to another castle, and on the next turn, they'll move over. You can also click people to toggle between building and gathering. Uh, it's very hard to see the status text right now because it's small. We threw that in quickly for right now. Uh, but he is set to building, and he, these three are set to gathering. So we'll see that each turn, these three will gather one supply each. This teddy bear will consume one, so we'll see supplies go up by two and victory progress will go up by one. What we have planned for the rest of the game is we've made a lot of progress in terms of the intuitiveness of our game once you understand it, but right now there's a lot in the game that isn't explained from the get-go. And so uh, if I give that spiel to anyone, they can play the game fine and uh, they do pretty well with it, but if you just open up the game, you're lost. So a lot of our work is going to be on the UI of making things more self-evident and making sure that people can understand what's going on and what their actions will do without me having to stand there and tell them. Okay. Any questions? All right, so I'm going to ask you again. Um, what is your biggest risk going forward? So, I mean, I think um, in terms of our technical implementation, we've already got good play tests of our work done, and we have, like, all of our major graphics in and things like that. So I think our major risk going ahead is not being able to explain the game properly. And so even if we have a finished product, like it may, it may still not be playable if we don't write good instructions. All right. So on that front, think of uh, uh, incremental uh, additional features. So the game begins with a super simple, even maybe too boring choice, but then a new choice arrives. So the, the learning by playing can be staggered uh, in a way that is that is intuitive. Good, good luck to you, and uh, we'll talk more about uh, choices later. But okay. I, by the, I should say that this high versus low prediction is something that I wish scientists did, like you're doing, because most people say one value, and then it's not that value it's somewhere <laughs> here, and then everyone doesn't really report it. So good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so it's a little light on there, but our game is Hello Waves. It's a game about forecast-based financing that we're developing for the Red Cross. The idea of forecast-based financing is using the idea of forecasts about the future in order to make decisions that are more effective than just reacting to disasters when they happen. So uh, I'd like to show you a playthrough of our game. 
So, uh, as I said, hello waves. Here are the instructions. Uh, we would have done a tutorial if we had enough time, but this gets the idea across uh, and uh, designing a, a good tutorial that actually teaches the player well is kind of hard to do in a, a logical flow. So we have these instructions that explain how to play, uh, what the point of the game is, and uh, a couple of tips about how the game works. So if we go into the play screen, you can see something similar to uh, what we showed you a couple weeks ago, where you have all these different toys at their castles. And as you go through the days, you'll see a forecast of what the water level is going to be at over time. And so you can see that right now they're gathering candy. The water level will change. This character is underwater, and so he takes damage. And so what you actually want to do is you want to move toys out of the water so that they don't get damaged. However, they can only move one castle over at a time. So because we didn't think ahead well enough, we'll see that this truck will actually take damage on the next turn because he's underwater. Actually, he ended up not underwater. We got lucky there. But theoretically, he, he would have. And so as you go through it, the end goal of the game is to build a castle. Uh, and so every toy, when they're home, can either choose between gathering candy to feed evacuated toys or building the castle to reach your end goal of the game. And then the idea of the forecast is that you want to use the forecast in order to know how much candy you're going to need over the next couple days, and to use it to know when you are going to need to evacuate various toys from their variously heighted homes. So back to the presentation. Turn to full screen. So we had a couple of challenges in the design process. The first and the major one is really that we were trying to teach about forecast-based financing, which was a bit of an abstract topic. It's a little different than just thinking long-term because you have to use the idea of there's some information we know about the future that we want to use to make optimal decisions, or at least decisions based on some idea of the risk that's out there. But we also wanted to avoid things like just pushing a button to win where you have all the information you ever need and there's just one option that you know you're going to pick every time and the game has no thought whatsoever. And we also needed to think about how we were going to communicate the forecast to the player so that they could then use that to make decisions. Uh, one of the problems that we also ran into related to this was that we focused a lot on the idea of forecast-based financing as the topic and then tried to build a game built on top of that topic instead of building a game that used forecast-based financing. So that held us back a lot in the beginning when we were trying to come up with ideas. We also had a really difficult initial targeted audience of policymakers, 50, 60-year-old uh, government officials or people at NGOs who are going to be using forecasts to make decisions of some sort. And it was supposed to teach them about how they can use forecasts to make these decisions. Except this was a really difficult audience because they don't generally play games. and uh, they don't have a lot of time to learn about this kind of thing, and so we couldn't really expect to get them to sit down for a long period of time and play around with our game. In order to deal with these problems, we came up with a couple solutions. The first thing was that we had no idea what kind of game would work or would make sense or anything like that. So what we did is we just broke up into group, into our team up into multiple groups and came up with a bunch of different prototypes. Uh, on paper, we had two different prototypes, one that focused on the idea of managing a city and its resources and its response to disasters versus focusing on individual people and how you're going to move them around to keep them safe from the disasters. And then we went into a whole bunch of different digital prototypes, one that was a text-based game about managing a city. We had one that looked like this, where you had two different cities and you were specifying what workers were going to do or when they would leave the city in order to stay safe. And then we would take the different ideas that we were learning from both of these prototypes, combine them together, take things out. And our final prototype actually uses ideas from all of these. Another solution that uh, we kind of got lucky with is when Pablo came to play our game, he told us that we actually shouldn't focus on the policymakers because he wasn't confident that he could actually get them to play the game. And so we switched our target to being grade schoolers, which is why you saw the sort of cutesy art with the beach and the toys. This actually made it a lot easier for us because we could target people who probably had some experience with games or at least wanted to do something fun and would uh, be curious to learn about uh, our topic. So another um, 
for our development process. Uh, or I can just speak here, right? Yeah, you can speak right in front of that. Okay. So uh, another uh, big issue we ran uh, another set of challenges that we ran into was through our development process, and so um, we had initially issues with communication and facilitation. Our team had a wide variety of like uh, experiences and backgrounds. Some were hardcore gamers, some mostly mobile gamers, and so there were initially a lot of disagreements on what level of game uh, we wanted to create and like what sort of game, casual versus hardcore, that we wanted to create. And so we needed to overcome like challenges of facilitation and communication within our team. Uh, another major challenge in our development process that we had to face came from our design issues, where for a very long time, we had kind of a vague <laughs> vision of what to do. We didn't know what kind of game we wanted to make, and so we purposely tried to keep our game ideas vague as we built prototypes. But then we ran into issues where um, we would have solutions, but like no consensus on which solution was best, and where we would, um, and where we went for long periods of time without having a clear direction of where we wanted our final game to be. So um, our solutions for uh, the challenges proposed by the development were a team structure, and so we structured our team loosely. Uh, into three sub-teams, a production sub-team, which would uh, take care of uh, production, like the uh, deliverables and making sure that all the uh, game ideas are being uh, communicated properly. A technical team, which um, worked primarily with the code and making sure the game got done. And then a user experience team, which handled art, UI, and uh, sound. And so we kept a flexible responsibility. Uh, we kept the responsibilities flexible. So you know, as team members got busy over the semester, or as like changing conditions led to different people contributing, um, we kept uh, responsibilities were able to easily flow between teams and team members. And um, additionally, another idea we uh, started with in the beginning was the idea of sub team leaders. Um, which are the two people marked with the L's, but that was an idea we later abandoned in favor of just having a more flexible team structure or flat team structure. Um, another solution for helping our development process was the use of good code practices. And uh, I cannot emphasize enough that this really helped speed up our development because of we didn't run into trouble with code. It was mostly with design. So we used um, we used Yeoman, which is a JavaScript uh, scout module system. And basically, it allowed our code to be interoperable. We could write one module separately from another module. So that solved a lot of issues with like dependencies or like um, people working in parallel, because it allowed people to you know, work in parallel without overwriting each other's code. Um, we also used good code practice with state machines and MVC, which is model view control. <coughs> and so we had a very you know, object-oriented code, very modular. And when we did need to you know, uh, change our code, rip it all out, and put it back in, it actually didn't turn out to be too painful, because we just had to switch a couple objects around. Um, all right. And then one final solution that we used for, uh, for our development processes were <coughs> Slack and Scrum. So Slack is like a modernized IRC chat room, and it's very feature rich. It has a lot of integrations with uh, GitHub and Google Drive and things like that. And so that sort of real-time communication actually made it so that we didn't really have to meet outside of class too often. Uh, we, if someone was working, we would just email out saying, we're on, I'm on the Slack and then people could meet on the Slack, and it was full-featured enough. Like, we could send attachments and things like that. that yeah, most of our communication, in-person communication, could be done in class. And in class, we adopted a uh, sort of like daily scrum format, where uh, we simply said what we had done since the previous class and what our goals were uh, until next class. So in the end, though, we did have to cut some features. Uh, um, these features 
mainly where the idea of multiple, again, mul a tutorial or multiple levels, uh, simply because there would just be too much content that we would need to play test in order to make sure that it like was a consistent quality and like got our message across. Um, and also trying to add more individuality to the uh, to the toys that you saw. Um, they have different graphics, but that's as much as we could do given the time constraints. And so, kind of just bring it back. Um, and our worst three worst decisions um, were first we spent a lot of we did end up spending a lot of time on code and assets that never got used. We maybe like used 10% of our final, 10 to 20% of our final work in our final project. Actually, maybe that is a bit uh, overkill, but um, okay, maybe 30% of our final uh, code and assets in our final project. Um, this really was due to uh, this second bad decision that we kept the game and its direction too vague for too long. We always were holding out that, oh, maybe we'll be able to come up with a better game idea, or maybe we'll find some magic solution to how we can make for forecast-based financing into a game. And because of this mindset, we spent po probably the first half of the project like just staying too vague. And that hurt us in the end because we spent so much time going in all these different directions. And really, um, really the uh, decision that kind of captures those first two, though, is the fact that we tried to make a game on top of forecast-based financing. So we had forecast-based financing, and we were like, how can we skin this as a game? Whereas once we switched that mindset and thought, let's have a game, and how can we put forecast-based financing into it? I think uh, that was the moment that we then came together as a team and really started making the final game that we wanted. And so our best decision, so, um, yeah. So uh, one of our best decisions was that we chose good tools at the beginning, which meant that as we went through all these different digital prototypes, we actually didn't have to completely rewrite our game. We could pull out the way that workers worked in one game, we could pull out the view that we were using in another game, and then we could just combine them together, and that allowed us to move quickly whenever we were changing our prototype. We also weren't afraid to trust each other, uh, both in terms of what everyone was working on, but also in terms of the decisions that we were making. And so when we said that we had to throw something out, we all understood that it was for the best, uh, the good of the project. And we, we didn't have a lot of complaining or hurt feelings when something didn't get put in, or when we decided to throw out our assets or code. And when we got to the end, we had been through enough of sort of this vagueness that we were all kind of frustrated with it, and we realized that we had an idea that we all liked and we really got on board with it and made it happen. Once we started working on our final idea, we saw that it worked. Uh, basically, every decision from that point on was how do we make this game better? Uh, and we were all on board with that vision. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. <laughs> Anyone in the audience have uh, feedback for them first before? Yeah, we'll have to make all of our slides darker. Yeah, yellow and white. Uh, yeah. yeah, like the yellow and white on your on your early screen. Yeah, I was doing this on the instruction screen. I realize that's the game, not the the um, presentation. But wow. <laughs> it's also a little faded in the game itself. It could yeah. be the display resolution you're using. So after after we're done with everything, yeah. try yeah. a different resolution, see if it makes a difference. Yeah. Um, the music in the game demo was too high. Um, it was overpowering your voice. Oh, okay. uh, so, you know, I think you were almost hollering just to be able to be heard. It uh, doesn't need to be that loud. So you can just crank down the volume light on the computer or on, on the controls over there. Um, something that I, that I had a question for, uh, you don't have to answer it today, um, but you might want to put it in your presentation, was how long was the design of what you've what you eventually establish on the table before you decided that this was the thing that you were going for, right? Because I'm assuming it was one of your vague, it, it came up during your vague idea phase, and you're, and you're implying that you were in that mode for too long, but <coughs> I don't know how long it was on the table, or was it only something you figured out at the end of the vague idea phase? 
Um, because you, otherwise you wouldn't have been able to switch to this idea if it was not on the table in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and how did you decide this was it, that the, the Sandcastle game was going to be it? Um, I understand, I, I think you, you very clearly explained the benefits of deciding this was it, mm -hmm. but how did you come to that conclusion? Sure. Was, uh, that's stuff I wanted to hear more about. But you don't have to answer it now. Yeah, I might also, um, just a little bit of specificity. You mentioned you spent too long on that design phase. I wonder how long that was. Okay. Yeah. Um, you said Pablo switched your target audience for you. Um, telling us whether that was because of the game that you saw or because of something else. If you know that information, mm -hmm. throw it in there. If you don't know that information, that's fine. Um, knowing why you, you dropped the team lead, you mentioned you, you dropped it, but you didn't exactly say why. Again, really quick, this is what it, this is, we weren't getting blah out of it, mm -hmm. or the flexibility was more, whatever. Um, and then you had to, oh, um, defining your terms, you're saying things like casual versus hardcore, give a little bit of definition of what you, what you mean by that. Um, it means different things for everybody. So what is your, what is your use of that? Yeah, I think um, you specifically said hardcore and mobile. Uh, but there are hardcore mobile players yeah. out there, so this is, this is like... And casual can be considered a version of hardcore, just in a different way. So just be, really, just yeah. be a little bit more clear about... Because I think you're talking about the target audience and the kind of players and the kind of games they might play. So just be a little bit more, more focused on what exactly you're, you mean by that. Um, that's it for me. Yeah, so just a technical observation, uh, Yellow Man is not really a mod module framework. It's just a system to generate a project. And so yeah, just check that. Okay. So that's terminology issue then. Yeah. 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 I mean, it clear, clear, clearly it worked out for your team. So we're not saying like don't mention your man. It's clearly a good thing, but just check your definition of what it, of what it is. Because, because it'll be more helpful for other people to understand what it is so that they can think about whether they want to use it in the future. Oh, actually, so your demo, mm -hmm. you spent about three minutes doing it. Um, we are going to have you have the, a player from the audience play your, your game live okay. without, doing, or without getting a lot of help. You can talk over it. Uh -huh. You can, after a while, start helping them. We, need, we want to see them at least just start playing it on their own. Decide okay. when you're going to put that demo in. You could actually combine them both together if you do it at the beginning or end. Um, but if you do that, give, give the player a little bit of time before you start talking. Okay. Sure. That's all I got. Great. Thanks. Sure, thank Snap, come on down. Hello. We are Hello Waves. We're a game about forecasting, uh, specifically this idea called forecast-based financing of using forecasts to make decisions about possible disasters in the future and how to prepare for them. We'd actually like to start with a playthrough of our game. So if Anybody would like to be a volunteer to, to try it out? A guest from not our class. If one could please come down. Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> Hi, I'm Andrew. <laughs> oh, do you need a chair? I'm not sure how to full screen. But um, anyways, this is our game. Uh, I'd recommend looking at the instructions first and yeah. reading through them. Thanks. And we'll keep the description minimal as you read through it just to, okay. to sort of sh show the player's initial reaction to it. Music. So as you can see, our game, as I said before, you uh, control some toys at, uh, on a day at the beach. And so by dragging and dropping them between the castles, you'll see that their statuses change and say that they want to move on their next turn or that they want to be collecting or that they're going to be collecting candy or anything like that. 
And the game is turn-based, so uh, all the actions will resolve on the next turn. And so uh, when you go to the next to turn, you'll see all the toys move uh, as specified by the status bubble above their heads. But unfortunately, you'll find that when toys have been evacuated, they're unhappy and need candy to survive, so they'll all take damage. <laughs> And so you'll see that on this turn, instead, uh, now they have their statuses set to gathering candy, except for the dump, dump truck who's still evacuated. And so the idea is that as the player plays through it, they get better at understanding how to use the forecast to make decisions about the future, uh, both in terms of how much candy that they need to have stocked up in order to weather out the rising tides, and also in terms of uh, when they're going to need to move their workers out of, or their toys out of areas that are in danger. So is there a reminder of where they started? Yeah, it's on the castle. It's actually blocked out right now okay. by, by the toys in front of it. But there's a little shadow there, an imprint. And because, yeah. because he ran out of candy and then, yeah. or actually, sorry, because he went to a place that was underwater, yep. uh, he took too much damage and then was swept away by the waves. <laughs> and so on the forecast you can see that high water is coming for quite a while uh, which is going to be a danger for the toys both in terms of possibly getting swept away and not having enough candy uh, for all the toys that you're going to have to move out of the way. Oh, <laughs> he may be out of luck. Yeah. And when you've lost two toys, you lose the game. <laughs> okay. Thank you for playing. <laughs> so that's Hello Waves. So, in our game, we had uh, a few challenges to overcome. The first was that our game was based on forecast-based financing, 
which is a very abstract topic. It's, it's a pretty understandable idea of using information about the future and ideas of risk in order to decide where to allocate resources, but it's still a bit abstract and building a game around it uh, took a little bit of work. It's useful to note that it's different than long-term planning. It's not just thinking about what will happen in the future, you know, building a dam to prevent water or things like that. It's actually about using the information you have to make the best decision for events that may be upcoming in the semi-near future. We also wanted to avoid making a game that was overly preachy or simplified, where it was clear how, exactly how you're going to win, and you could just basically push the forecast-based financing button to win the game. We want players to actually think and understand the concepts there, instead of just you know, coming up with the buzzword of forecast-based financing. And finally, we had the challenge of actually communicating that forecast to players in a way that they would be able to understand and then make use of. You could see in that game that we had water levels and it would show on the map. And we found that players were pretty good at using that in order to, decide, to make decisions about what was going to happen in the future and how to allocate their resources. The other big challenge that we had in the beginning was that our initial target audience was policymakers. Uh, like for Snap, Pablo had come in and pitched us this game idea, and originally he had wanted us to build a game for policymakers that would help them understand the benefits of forecast-based financing, and therefore convince them that they should develop policies that would uh, give resources to plans based on forecast-based financing. So I would like to take you through a couple of our prototypes just to show you the evolution and comment sort of on our process. Uh, actually, uh, and to to preface that, we had a lot of prototypes because our idea was so abstract and because we weren't sure how to address our audience. So we built a lot of prototypes to start with. Uh, we had ideas that ranged across sort of levels of scope of what you controlled, where you controlled entire cities or where you controlled individual workers and moved them around. And then we would pull from all these different kinds of ideas, what worked, what didn't, what did people understand, what confused them. And from that, we got a really good idea of what concepts helped people understand the idea and brought them into this final game that we ended up with. So the project started on October 15th, and this was our first prototype. It was a terminal-based game where you had some kind of information about a future rainfall, and then you had to type in your commands of how you controlled different cities. This, actually, people found it fun, but as you might expect, the feedback wasn't very good and people didn't quite understand how to move forward with it. It, made it, it put a lot of cognitive load on people. So when we moved forward, we tried to give people more easily understandable actions to use. But the problem with this game was that it was time-based and it updated every second. And so there were so many numbers flying at people that even MIT students who play tested it couldn't understand. So we figured that people like policymakers who didn't have much experience with games really wouldn't be able to understand the game at all. So instead, we went to turn-based. And that helped, but at the same time, it's tough to see on this projector, but we have a forecast underneath that says how much rainfall is expected. And again, that wasn't understandable to people because they couldn't understand what three inches of rainfall meant for their city. And they couldn't understand how that contributed to a possible disaster. At this point, Pablo actually came by the class and played the game. And then he told us that he wasn't even sure that he could get policymakers to play the game because they may not have enough time. Instead, he wanted us to switch to grade schoolers because we could teach them something about forecast-based financing and help them understand as they grew up. And this was great for us because making a game that was serious, easy for somebody who didn't have experience with games to play, and also fun and engaging was too difficult for us, actually. So moving to grade schoolers was awesome. He also suggested that we try to make the idea of rainfall or water levels more visceral. And that's when we came upon this idea of the rising waters. Whenever players looked at this, they instantly understood the concept of the game. The feedback might not be there, the beautiful UI might not be there, but the idea of having cities with workers in them and a rising water level coming towards them, everybody understood that, and it made it a lot easier for players to reason about the game. From there, we added things like nicer art, better feedback, which you can't quite see in the static picture, uh, more improvements to how the forecast worked, and uh, Eventually, we ended up with our final version today. Uh, yeah. So to talk a little bit about our actual development process, so our team was structured into three main sub-teams. Production, which was in charge of managerial roles, deliverables, and play testing. 
And so there was a shared responsibility of like uh, their uh, technical team, which was in charge of the bulk of the uh, coding work, and a user experience team, which would be in charge of assets, UI design, and UI design. Um, we also initially envisioned like a sub team leaders where we'd be kind of communicating through them, but uh, we found the concept kind of redundant. And so we worked pretty much with like a flat structure between the three teams. Um, so from the beginning, we encouraged good coding practice. And so we used uh, good tools available to us. One of these is um, Yeoman, which is a JavaScript scaffolding framework. Um, and this helped us out a lot by basically automating a lot of our JavaScript tasks and making our code modular. Um, we also used Phaser's state machine, which is this kind of, kind of badly documented like new fa feature in the Phaser game engine, which was the uh, JavaScript game engine that we used. Um, it's a bit b badly documented, so, um, but it did save us a lot of headaches. And once we figured that out, that was uh, proved immensely helpful. And we also used MVC, which is a uh, computer, uh, computer software engineering term, standing for model view controller. And again, um, by encouraging these good coding practices, we reduced dependencies and uh, made sure that our team was productive. Um, in terms of communication, we also, similar to Snap, use Slack, which is kind of like a modernized chat room. It's very feature rich. And so you can share files, channel, and things like that. And we also used the idea of the uh, daily scrum. We implemented it in class. And we would say what we had done that class, what we would be doing, um, and what we wanted to do uh, until next class. And so now the major challenges that we faced during the development process, though, um, were, were that our team members came from very different backgrounds and had very different preferences about games. You know, some of our some of our team members were hardcore StarCraft players and you know, very good at RTS games, while other members of our team preferred like a more laid back, you know, mobile game, Fruit Ninja kind of approach. And so trying to like mediate those two viewpoints and trying to create a game that would engage both, uh, both types of gamers was a challenge that we had to overcome. Um, and so, Another big challenge that we had in our development process, you know, as you saw through our uh, uh, progression through our different prototypes, was that our direction was not very clear until about halfway through the project. And so partially because we had uh, different ideas on what the game should look like, and also partially because we had such an abstract idea of forecast-based financing that you know, even we didn't have that good of a grasp on initially, um, it took us a while to really get settled on what we wanted to build. And so this really challenged our development process and, um, and made us have to kind of build a lot before we got something that we liked. And so um, eventually we did ha end up having to cut some features, uh, like multiple levels or like a guided tutorial for the player. Um, we s thought that this would introduce too much new content that would need to be play tested, balanced, and you know, um, tested to ensure consistency with the rest of our game, which we viewed as taking up too much time. And we also cut the idea of adding more individuality to the, indivi uh, to the workers or to the toys that you saw, um, other than different graphics for each. So, some of the worst things that we did on our team is that we spent a lot of time on work that got thrown out entirely. All the prototypes we did, they were actually pretty useful because of the things we learned about the concept and about how people would play the game. But we did spend a lot of time on things like art or you know, nitty gritty details that didn't really need to be figured out and that we could have put off until later in the project. We also kept the game direction too vague for too long. Uh, as Norman said, we spent a lot of time with that, and it probably ate up too much of our time. Although it helped us learn, we could have moved faster in the beginning to get to a solid idea, because once we got to a solid idea of the rising waters, our team started to centralize around it a lot better because we could actually deal with something concrete. While we were dealing with the abstract ideas, everybody was all over the place and arguing about things that didn't quite line up. And the worst decision, of all that we started with and that 
sort of made the problem of going too vague and all these other things happen is that we were originally thinking, how do we skin forecast-based financing as a game? How do we take this idea of using forecasts to make decisions and then just gamify it, which we eventually realized wasn't fun and didn't help us actually come up with any ideas. Instead, when we flipped it and started talking about what game could we create and use forecast-based financing to improve it and teach something, teach players how to play the game and therefore allow them to come out of the game having learned about forecast-based financing, the world sort of opened up, everything became a lot more interesting, and we found that we started to move faster. Some of the best decisions that we made, on the other hand, as Norman said, we had good tools, which meant that even when we threw out prototypes, although we wasted things like art resources and uh, things like that, we actually didn't end up wasting very much code because things like the idea of workers or cities could literally be pulled out of the old games we had, put into our new game, and then reworked to build our, our new structure. We also weren't afraid to trust each other and throw out the things that didn't work. Once we started moving fast, we had a lot of ideas that would come out and we'd say, OK, this doesn't work. We're actually going to scrap it. Or, uh, you know, we think that this isn't the direction we need to go in. And everybody was willing to go along with it. It's not, good to feel, it's not a good feeling to see your things thrown out, but everybody understood that was for the best of the game, and I really appreciate their understanding with everything, too. And part of that all comes down to the fact that we were on board with our final idea. We were all excited about the concept that we had. Part of that might have been the relief of coming to a concrete idea after spending so much time being vague, but once we had that concrete idea, we really moved fast and worked well around it. So thank you, and any questions? That was from our UI team. Oh, yeah. Where did you find it? Um, so it's on our credits page. Most of it was online. Uh, the credits page in our game. <laughs> it's a little small, I guess, up there. But it looks, yeah, Hold yeah. My Hand, AGP by... Would it be possible to be the credit short URL, please? <laughs> yeah, yeah. bit.ly link. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. We can, we can make a bit.ly link and we'll send it out to everyone. Can I just do it with Yeah. That's a good call. Uh, yes. Having watched the, the early crash and burn of the <laughs> playthrough, um, how often do people, I don't know if you've actually had a lot of people to play your, your current version of your game, uh -huh. uh, do people usually take a playthrough or two before they start getting the concept? Yes. That's why something like a tutorial would be really nice. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have the time to put it in. Yeah, no, no, I did. But I okay. yeah, usually what happens is even if after maybe a couple of turns of playing through, they start to get the idea, the problem is that as the water starts to rise, they haven't prepared enough. And so all their workers or the toys will starve or get carried away by the waves, which is a bit unfortunate and probably makes the players feel bad on the first time. But then they, it actually teaches them to think ahead about it. So the next playthrough, they're much more careful and understanding. Well, so I guess in terms of uh, early on, because we had a very different idea of uh, what we wanted to do early on in the process, we were thinking about games like Civilization and how did they communicate all these complex you know, worker movements and right. managing multiple cities. But uh, once we actually came up with this game concept, uh, I think we had much, much smaller goals. And so um, do we have any specific game models, do you think? Or? There's none that I specifically think of. Yeah. There were some things that you know, we were sort of inspired by. Standard tricks like when you hover over one of the characters, they got bigger. Some idea of showing off that this is clickable, right. things like that. But specific games themselves, uh, not really. I was just thinking, is 
it's, it ended up being kind of board gamey, and I feel like there's a lot of board games that where they've been thinking a lot about getting that right level of, uh, of uh, I guess, uh, tactics rather than strategy. But yeah, it, I guess it worked out. Yeah. So this, you, you mentioned that you were able to completely change how your workers looked and just keep your models. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the holy grail of object-oriented programming. <laughs> you have an object that's reusable and you don't have to throw out the, the code. Um, do you think there's like a reason why in particular you were able to achieve that? Because I think that's not, that's not common necessarily in object-oriented programming. Uh, <laughs> um, partially a little bit of OCD-ness, like very early on, very strictly saying um, we're going to write this object-oriented code and we're not just going to hack things together. I think that helped a lot because um, we actually spent the time in the very beginning to think about like which which objects were responsible for what and what their purpose should be. So yeah, basically, I think because we moved more slowly in the start and thought more carefully about how that code should be structured, we ended up with uh, having an easier time later on. There's also the fact that because we had learned these things from the prototype, that we were putting into this game that also meant that the, the objects that we created, because we wanted similar functionality to things that we had already seen and we knew worked, it meant that we were comfortable pulling out the functionality into that. Uh, so I, won't, I don't want to say it was designed to fit, but there is, some, there is the fact that we moved it on purpose, really. I will add something on that. So, uh, we had a very good MVC model. Uh, so models were uh, in a tree-like structure, and it was very easy to uh, change models. So models knew about, uh, sorry, used uh, knew about models, but models had no idea about values. So basically, it was quite easy. 